Welcome uh, to an event that I think is going to be very interesting. And I cannot take any credit for the creativity. It's all Patricia's. And uh, what I wanted to um, start with is to give her a chance uh, to introduce herself. But what I'll do is just briefly so that I can kind of get out of the way and then be the one asking the questions. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Joanne Highland. I'm the president and founder of the R Innovation Group. But I think more importantly for this session, I'm also on the ISPIM board. And this is something that is being supported through the ISPIM board as um, you know, being able to actually uh, host these fireside chats, which is a new format that we've taken on in, in the last little while. So um, without any further ado, I wanna pass it over to Patricia, first of all, to let her introduce herself. Um, she's had uh, quite a very interesting career, uh, all the way from vaccine manufacturing to toys. Uh, so quite uh, extensive uh, experience. And she comes a little bit out of the innovation space, but I think more importantly, out of supply chain and, and so forth, which is a very interesting spin for all of us from an innovation management point of view. So Patricia, please uh, introduce yourself and then we'll get into the chat. When we talk about my long career, let's start with the fact that I really started when I was 12. Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, I have been, as Joanne mentioned, in many different industries, uh, healthcare, information technology, telecom, government, uh, and, and on and on and on. And uh, my last iteration was at the United Nations uh, with one of the major agencies there. And one thing that throughout is, as um, Joanne indicated, is my areas in supply chain, uh, procurement, sustainability. And although people will often look and say, oh, well, how can you innovate in that and operations and things like that? Uh, I wouldn't be in it if I couldn't do it. However, given the uh, session today, I can tell you that I have a flat forehead sometimes from banging my head against the wall uh, and dealing with a lot of uh, resistors uh, to innovation and change. And I think most of us have felt that and uh, have the scars to prove it. But I won't go on, you can read more about me or connect with me on LinkedIn uh, if you so desire. Yes, well, so thanks, over. Patricia. Okay, so um, Georgia will be supporting us. And for those of you who I see, we've already started to get a few things into chat. Um, so if uh, there are some questions, um, we will take them. Uh, we're gonna kind of manage our time accordingly, but I do have a few questions that Patricia and I prepared together to get things going. And as you can see, she has a very interesting, I would say phenomenal uh, street art design behind her. And, um, you know, I think this really inspired her. So she's told me this story, but can you tell everyone like how you came about this? Uh, what does it mean to you? You know, how did it resonate with you and so forth? So, you know, please uh, yeah, tell a this, little bit of the parable. Yeah, so I went on a street art tour in Valencia and this was one of the street arts and I stood in front of it I think most people who traveled and saw the street art didn't have the same reaction to it. And I went, oh, that's my life. <laughs> I am constantly trying, to, you know, the when you try to innovate and you try to change and you try to move people forward, there's all those snails that try to tether you and hold you down from being able to achieve, you know, what I believe is, is excellence through innovation. And so I've, I, I took a, a picture of that and have used it to, to demonstrate how, how you, know, you can get frustrated and, and you can see the horse trying to back off and get away from the snails. And, but yeah, I, it, it resonated with me because I thought it was a absolute depiction of those who try to innovate and those who are trying to, and those are trying to hold them back. Okay, so Mindy, following on with that from your experience, um, where do you actually find the snails? And, um, you know, why are they resistant to innovation? And, you know, in effect, they try to rein in the horse. So 
kind of what's the phenomenon based on what you've been through? Well, you can find snails everywhere. And sometimes snails are actually trying to act as if they're not snails until you actually uncover them and say, mm, yeah, you're a snail. Uh, there's, there's numerous reasons for uh, being a snail and trying to hold up innovation. There's the policy and regulation snails, the ones who say, oh, you can't do that because it's against policy, it's against regulation, and, and that sort of thing. And actually, again, in all of these, I've encountered all of these, and you dive down and, and you challenge the snail, and in fact, there is no policy, there is no regulation against this, or if there is a policy, it's been, you can change it. There are industry snails. There's the ones who say, well, you might have been able to do that there, but you can't do that here. And considering the multiple different industries that I've been in, in I can tell you very clearly that things are transferable. You just have to make sure you understand the 20% of that 80-20 rule, and you can also implement them. And then there's the leadership snails, the ones who say, like I've had encounters when I've shown up and they say, well, the CEO won't want that or the auditors won't want that or the, the senior leadership team, which I was often part of, won't want that. And I said, well, let me deal with that. What else do you have? So, so, and I'm sure each of you can think of other snails that you've encountered. I mean, sometimes the snails are big. I was just looking and saying the biggest snail that ever was found was in Sierra Leone and it's 15.5 centimeters. So, so there are some big snails, there are some smaller snails, but that's um, basically, and you have to challenge them. Uh, you know, like for example, I once got, uh, when I had a team working for the US government, uh, client and they said, oh, that's against the federal acquisition regulations. And I heard that over and over again. So I showed them, I went and bought the book, which is about this big. And I said, great, I want to learn, show me. And they said, well, it's not quite like that in there. And I said, well, I like the legalese, show me. Uh, I can get around it. And at the end of the day, it was just because it's always been done that way and they don't want to change. Okay, um, um, I know, you know, we talked about also in addition to that, you, that you think of yourself more as a horse um, and you know, a, a little bit of a disruptor as a result of that. Uh, and you've worked a lot in the sustainability area and, you know, you worked at the UN, uh, you were the, I think the chief procurement officer there at the time. Um, I'm sure you've run into a lot of snails, especially in an organization like the UN where it must be very difficult to be able to get things done because you really are dealing with the United Nations literally. Um, so, you know, it makes sense for sustainability. And so how do you get the program moving in a UN ops type of situation or elsewhere when there are a lot of people that are just happy with the status quo? Yeah, the, the, the thing is that um, you have to be courageous. And yes, the UN, uh, you know, just because of its structure and, and things like that, very risk averse. Uh, snails are very risk averse. The sustainability figure would be an easy thing, right? It's like everybody wants to do sustainability. And when I talk about sustainability, I talk about the social, economic, and environmental. <clears throat> but then you get resistors and, and immediately it's like, well, it costs too much. That's, that's always the thing. And actually you can do a lot of things that are somewhat simplistic uh, and don't cost anything, or you readjust budgets to accommodate that. You get, you know, the, um, you know, from the social perspective, uh, for us to get a flag on the United Nations Global Marketplace uh, that identified women-owned businesses, which is part of the social sustainability, almost took a couple of years. And that was because of all the agencies saying, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, positive discrimination, which I went, okay. <laughs> so so it's, it's not discrimination, it's, it's positive. And then the environmental, I mean, you know, the, the, there's trying along the way, but a lot of times it's also dealt with a lot, you know, the UN is funded 
And so we have to listen to what our donors desire. Our donors indicate they, they give us money for a project and they want this project and that's what you do. There is little discussion at the beginning in regards to innovation, in regards to sustainability, in regards to any of that. And so there's a handcuff often by the UN uh, agencies because of that. I had a discussion once uh, with a number of ambassadors and they were saying, oh, the UN is not innovative. It's like a dinosaur. And I said, well, it's not really a dinosaur. Turtle, maybe a little bit, but not a dinosaur. But I said, you are the ones who are keeping us from being innovative. You are giving us funding and then you don't have the discussion of what does this funding really mean? How can we do things differently? If you're trying in, a, in one of the African countries, trying to get better maternal health care, do you want to have a building with your name on it, which is what you're saying, or are you going to address mobile clinics, associated sustainability in those things? And, and they go, oh, Oh, so it's so we're a part of the problem. So it's absolutely a part of the problem. So please do not call us dinosaurs. We're happy to work with you. So, um, so Patricia, maybe just to change a little bit and look at it more from the innovation management perspective now. And um, one of the themes that you know we've been carrying through, and in fact, I just came from a session on innovation agents about. Innovation is everywhere and nowhere and kind of what stops us from innovating like crazy. And, you know, you've touched on a bit of it, um, but from looking at it with your innovation lens, when, when you were working in your various roles, you know, clearly um, a lot of leadership don't know how. Some, I know I've heard a lot of CEOs say that they want innovation everywhere. Uh, but do you really want innovation everywhere on your assembly line, for example, or in your manufacturing process and so forth? So, you know, what are your thoughts from an innovation management perspective about what is stopping us from innovating like crazy? I think one of the issues is definition. Uh, innovation is, you know, as you said, everywhere and nowhere. Uh, but that's because there isn't a common defi definition. Most people think of innovation as, you know, the, the big, hairy, audacious, um, innovative approach. But in reality, sometimes it can be very small. When you look at, uh, yes, it's sort of like I said with the ambassadors is you don't innovate. And, um, you know, when you look at innovation professionals, you might be able to get the the that hurdle away as what is innovation define it exactly how can you in fact um, get the um, get the organization to to have an innovation culture and when I come into an organization I say I'm not going to be the only innovator here. Uh, I'm not going to be the only one that's doing this. I actually, in my teams, make innovation uh, part of their objectives. They can come up with an idea, uh, an approach, or something that, in effect, uh, in their objectives for that year, together with someone or not, and have it either a big thing or a little thing, and so on. Um, I think it's important that, you know, I think the innovation professionals can, can sort of begin leading the path and changing uh, the, the culture, erasing the fear, because that's a lot of reasons why people don't innovate. They, they are fearful that all of a sudden they're going to be left out in the cold. But then it's important that the organization owns it because a lot of times when you have people coming in uh, there are people who resist and say hey you know I'm just going to wait it out um, because these people will be gone soon so I think it's it's important for you know to, to identify the barriers to identify those snails to cut those tethers 
uh, to the horse, and then and then I think innovation professionals can support that. Good, thanks, Patricia. And I'm, I'm I'm also monitoring the chat, so I did catch it, Georgia, by the way. Um, and we have something that came in from Chris, which is related to the parable. So let me just read it. And Chris, also feel free to jump in. Um, the horse and snail metaphor is lovely, but what does it say about power and self-perception? Some see the innovation manager as a fly that is bothering the horse that is pulling the plow. So what are your thoughts <laughs> about that? <laughs> Well, you know, the fly can also be supportive in getting rid of other things around it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't disagree. The one thing, though, is when I look at the, at the uh, image, um, one of the problems is often that the horse doesn't recognize its own power. And it is being tethered by a bunch of friggin' small snails. And it's not, it's not understanding, it, it stops because it thinks that it is tethered when in reality it's not. So the importance is for, for the fly to whisper in the ear <laughs> of the horse and say, okay, we got this, you know, let's move forward um, because these snails will always just be snails and they're going to be left behind in the dirt. Chris, would you like to engage some more or is that good for now? Oh, I, I, lo I love that answer because I was sitting here looking at, as you're talking, I'm looking at the mural, which I love and I love the, 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 the metaphor. And I was thinking, if I'm the horse, I like my chances against those snails. Uh, but I think you're quite right in terms of sometimes those snails can have a powerful effect and you think that that tether is going to hold you back, but maybe not. So I, I, I really appreciated that answer. That's a very good, good insight. Okay, thank you, Chris, for the, the question and the comment and uh, encouraging everyone to continue to use the chat because we will bring them in. So now I'm going to go on another question related to innovation management. Uh, so there's a number of us that think with having brought in the ISO standard for the innovation management system, uh, watching the parallels from what's happened in the project management world and the quality management world, that we're at a tipping point now from an innovation management perspective. And it'd be interesting to ask you because we can get obviously very biased living in this world every day. Um, so do you think we're at a tipping point from an innovation management point of view? And if so, what are the signs? And if not, you know, why do you think not? Well, that's a big question. Uh, the, <laughs> you know, when, I, when I look at sort of this, uh, and, and, I, and I'm be, you know, totally honest here, I, I hadn't heard of innovation professionals until we started engaging. So, um, so there, there needs to be sort of a, an uplift in the um, marketing, if you will, and, and, and um, you know, exposing what innovation professionals can do. And, and uh, I'll tell you, if I ask a lot of people around, they'd probably say the same thing, uh, that they hadn't heard of this uh, group as a profession. I do think there's a lot of things right now that are on the tipping point. Uh, when you look at innovation, I think there's a lot of people sitting back right now, uh, post uh, hopefully very soon post COVID that are saying, how can we do things differently? And there's more of an opening for that. So, you know, and, and equally with supply chain, because, you know, I've been, I've been banging my head against the wall for many years as well, saying supply chain is strategic, it can support, it's not a tactical aspect, all those sorts of things. And I think supply chain is as well at a tipping point. So the, the, I think there's uh, a lot of, uh, I don't think a lot of people would understand how they can be supported effectively uh, by an innovation professional management um, uh, person. I, I certainly didn't. And I know that you're probably working with lots of country, uh, companies across the world, but I think many others are significantly struggling with how to innovate. And at this first, first sign of an issue or something, they'll run away. 
And that's where, you know, innovation professionals can actually almost be a um, therapist, if you will, uh, on how to, how to move that pendulum forward. So it's important um, to ensure that uh, you're recognized, you have, well, you have conferences like this, um, certainly for, for, for your profession, but innovation is on everybody's tip of the tongue, just like supply chain is right now. And I think it would be of significant value if the, if the innovation professionals actually um, gain more traction with a lot of these. Every time you see somebody talk about innovation, give them a call. Great. And so let's continue on that a little bit because we do a lot on from an innovation point of view about business model innovation. And obviously the supply chain is, is very critical to that. And you know, we also look at um, digital as an enabler uh, and so forth. So would you suggest that we need as a community to reach out to sort of our non-typical partners, look for internal partners in our companies or uh, fellow research people or whatever, where we could create more partnerships and be able to, you know, build the bridges with, say, supply chain and what we're doing in the innovation space, for example. A simple, simple answer is yes. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, you know, sometimes you know, to to have innovation uh, seed and become a DNA of the organization, you can't just start up here. You have to embed throughout. Uh, I do think there's lots of opportunity for, for partnerships. Uh, you know, if you look at the trends that right now, again, um, are, are high in re needing a reset, uh, certainly supply chain is, and I could go on for hours about, you know, how, how uh, the people could have been uh, ready for, for what was coming digitization, it's beyond the IT uh, group. It's, it's uh, significantly for the implementation across the board. Healthcare, healthcare is in crisis, you all know that. Uh, that is an area where a significant amount of innovation planning, uh, how to pivot, nobody knew how to pivot. And it's not a little bit like Monty Python, nobody ever expected the Spanish Inquisition, but and nobody expected a pandemic. So, but to sit back now and say, this isn't ever gonna happen again uh, is a problem. The issues of ransomware um, are going to become much more important as well, how to innovate and ensure that when you're hit with, with ransomware, you're not down. There's a hospital here in Toronto that's been down now for two weeks uh, because of a ransomware hit. So long-term care, what, what happens with the, how can you innovate in that space? People look at it and say, well, we'll just throw more money at it. Uh, that's not the solution. Sustainability, just throw more money at it. I'll tell you, I implemented significant amount of sustainability initiatives that did not require a lot of money, actually saved money and became a key and key key differentiator for the for the business um, against its competition. So you just have to have you know the thought. I mean, you know, innovation professionals can be the facilitators to help move that forward. But yeah, I you know, so that's kind of my answer there. So a question then. Um... How do I, how would we reach you? What, you know, what would be the two or three key messages that you would want to hear from an innovation point of view to make it attractive for somebody that's dealing in more the supply chain side of things to want to actually partner? Well, first of all, uh, it's, it's important to see you know, to make sure that you're talking to, to people who um, are recognized as the innovators in the industry and, and partner as, as, you know, we're talking today and, 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 and partner in that regard, because that gives you some credibility um, to those that you may be talking to. 
Uh, I think um, success stories um, are always uh, of value of, of things that have been done. Some of the organizations today um, are going to be struggling with being competitive, and a lot of them are just maybe going to go off the cliff because right now everybody's going, oh, well, we got all this stuff being delivered online and so forth, and, and we're good. Um, healthcare, supply chain and healthcare. I mean, that's that's been a key issue and so on. So I would say that you look at who's out there, there's associations like there's Supply Chain Canada um, Association, there's different that they have um, conferences as well. Uh, I, I think that even there's a lot of magazines out there that are supply chain focused that are focused for other types of professions too. And, but, but pick a lane. Uh, you know, it, and that's where I'm saying, you know, sort of innovation is this or it's this. Uh, sustainability, a lot of companies are struggling. And, you know, you can look, I can look at any website and tell you right away if they're serious about sustainability or basically it's just a whitewash. And a lot of them are whitewashed. A lot of them are lying uh, about their sustainability initiatives and things like that. So, um, so I think it's, it's stepwise, but, you know, you can, you know, you can see, you can, you can find the companies, often those who've just had a change in some sort of leadership, those are the ones who are going to be ready to innovate and ready to listen. Yeah, and I, I know from my experiences, uh, building internal networks, that when we would go out and reach to out to somebody say in supply chain or HR or finance, like the, the non-traditional areas where you don't really think to look for partners, you also look for people with the right mindset, the, the ones that are innovative thinkers and so forth, because you have a more likely chance of success with them than with others. So um, I'm just checking our time. I've been monitoring our chat. We don't have any other questions, but okay, so this is probably gonna be a little bit of a stretch question for you, Patricia, because you're not really um, involved in our space of innovation management. And as you said, you kind of just became aware of it more recently. But what would you think, like, where do you think innovation management will be in a decade from now? Like, what would it look like? And, you know, maybe drawing some parallels from your other experiences. <laughs> well, that's not a tough question at all. Um, I think, I think, I think um, again, you know, and you draw, drew the parallel earlier to project management. Um, project management in the past was just something people did. Um, there, there, and, and throughout the last, you know, probably 15 years or so, it's become much more a profession with designations associated and that sort of thing. I believe that you know, innovation management can go the same way. It's, it's, <clears throat> but your problem is everybody talks innovation. And so saying you're an innovation management professional uh, becomes a bit of a problem because somebody else will say, well, I innovate all the time. So you need to, you need to focus on, on how you can differentiate yourself, how you can market your profession effectively and, and tell the stories. And I think, uh, like I said, I mean, supply chain has been struggling. I started in this area before it was even called supply chain. So it's, um, it, it, and we're still fighting that. Um, perception that we don't necessarily are immediately in that realm. But I, I think I think innovation is now there. You have to differentiate yourself. What are the key areas? Is it simple? Is it more digitization? Is it more policy? Policy kills innovation. So there's a there's a that's the snails. Policy kills innovation. So when you're innovating, you need to, you know, as a professional, you can identify those key areas that will keep organizations from doing that. So yeah, stretch one, I, I, I hope that it, it, it uh, catapults into the future, but a lot of it is recognition that you're actually there. Okay. That's great, Patricia, because it's very nice to get the, uh, the perspective from the outside looking in rather than us all being so involved in it every day. 
and you know thinking of course everybody gets it but i do know that when i describe what i do most of the time people's eyes glaze over and we start talking about gardening or something like that so i'm sure there's a a few of you that experience that so we are unfortunately out of time uh, our 30 minutes went by very quickly i want to thank all of you for being a part of it and thank chris for your question and comment and most importantly to thank uh, patricia for sharing sort of a, a stories from a little bit of outside of our circle to see what others think uh, about innovation management. And of course, to Georgia for uh, being there to make sure that we didn't run into any technical challenges along the way. So thank you everybody and, and continue to enjoy the conference. Hope to see you in some other sessions and uh, have a good evening because most of you are in Europe at this point. We're still over here in North America. So we have a, a bit of a day to go ahead. So look forward to uh, seeing you around and thanks for your participation. Take care. Nice to meet you all. Thanks.